Welcome to the NC Choices webinar series, Teaching Tools for Beginning Farmers, funded by the United States Department of Agriculture's Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program. I am Matt LaRue, Agricultural Marketing Specialist for Cornell Cooperative Extension, and I'm going to present the module on Marketing and Pricing. This is one of seven modules offered in this webinar series. In this presentation, we'll talk about marketing strategy, if you're interested in the other resources offered by NC Choices, you can find out more on our website or on our YouTube channel. This section is um, of, profitable meat, of profitable meat marketing is on strategy. This is part one. And we start off with getting everyone up to speed on a definition of what marketing really is. Um, this is my own description that I've written, and it says that Marketing is, is an ongoing process of understanding what the consumer wants, developing that product, and getting it to them. And it's important to think about marketing being so different from production work because production work has a beginning uh, when the seed is planted or when the calf is born or when the, the piglet is born, uh, and then it has, you know, going through its lifespan, and then it has an end with harvest. But marketing doesn't have a clean, or obvious beginning and end. It's an ongoing process of understanding the consumer. It's also important to think about the fact that, that marketing is not the, the craft of misleading people to get them to buy something or to get them to buy more than they intended. Um, we're really taking this from a sincere point of view that we want to understand what people want in order to be able to deliver that to them. And, and that, of course, ensures our success as producers. And finally, I wanted to point out that marketing is not just advertising. I think that people often refer to their advertising or their special sales uh, as marketing, and that certainly is one part of marketing. But as you'll see in the coming slides and the coming presentations, um, it's not limited to just how you advertise and how you reach people. So I, I've developed over the years for small farms that I've worked with a basic four part marketing plan. And I really advocate that people develop even a simple version uh, of, a, of a plan like this with these four parts. Your marketing plan doesn't have to be a really long giant document. It can be the front and back of a piece of paper, but the point of the plan, just like a business plan, is to guide decision making and inform the actions that you take with your marketing in this case. So um, just to introduce these four sections, we have the strategy section, which is where you identify your specific audience, and that's the part that we're going to develop uh, further in this slideshow. Then there's doing some market research to understand the nature of the market, the size, the competitors, and uh, more detail about your identified special audience. Then there's writing objectives, which is to say, figuring out what you want to get accomplished, how much product you want to sell, where, um, and fulfilling that through your communication plan, which is the last section, or your action plan. This is how you put all this planning and work into actual action, and this is, of course, where you will see things like advertising or running promotions or special prices but you'll see that most of the plan is just getting a strategy and an outline that's informed. In this section, we'll cover very practical methods that are easy for a farm to, to adopt. Um, they're, they're really reasonable things that, that people can go right home and start working on. When we talk through this marketing plan, we're really talking about the efficiency of marketing labor, which is to say that we can measure and improve our marketing effectiveness or efficiency with this rate of gross sales per hour um, spent on marketing. I really focus on the time because for small farms that are primarily marketing direct to consumer, time will be the biggest marketing cost, whether it's standing at a farmer's market or making sales calls and deliveries and such, uh, interfacing with customers. Time is usually the biggest cost, but we can also include other dollars that are spent on marketing. So the nice thing about um, you know, using a rate like this is that we can really compare the different actions that we take with marketing and see how we can improve on the rate. Um, it can be improved in two main ways. That is to say that you could keep the level of sales that you're making 
uh, the same, but be able to cut down the amount of time or money that you put into marketing. And then the other way would be, let's say at a farmer's market where the, the amount of time is fixed, but you start generating greater sales, that also improves the rate. So whenever we refer to effectiveness of marketing, we are literally talking about a measurable rate, which is this gross sales per, per hour invested. So when we start in on marketing strategy, then we're going to think about the consumer and the, the choices that the person has to make. And I really like this slide, even though it's simple, because I'm thinking about this example, this, you know, this cartoon woman with a baby. When a person needs to go and get groceries, when they need to go get food, they uh, literally get in their car and they make a choice. And we're, we're examining that choice as marketers. So when we think about this example customer, let's say this might be our target customer, we're gonna think about why would they drive to the farmer's market instead of the grocery store? What might be some reasons? And this is sort of a group brainstorm that you would do with the people that are in attendance for your presentation. So you start asking them, uh, why, why would she go? And some of the reasons that they'll offer would be that the product is fresher or of higher quality. They might say uh, that they want, that she wants to support local farms and the local economy. Uh, and they might cite that she might perceive the, the food to be healthier uh, at the farmer's market than at the grocery store. And so what we can learn from these decisions is that our job as a marketer, if we think that our target customer is coming for one of these qualities, is to make sure that we're communicating that we possess that quality. So if she really desires to support local and the local economy, local farms, keeping agriculture active in her county and so on, then we'd want to make sure that there was a sign at our booth that said the town that our farm is in. So that's, that's the whole idea that we're going to kind of go over in this presentation is, we understand what the consumer wants, and then we make sure we communicate that you know we, we fit that in the case that we do. Uh, in the case that we're a, a local farm, then we'd want to communicate clearly, here's the town that our farm is in, right? We'd also want to make sure we had a, a sign on the road uh, outside the farm so that when people drive by, they, they realize that that's us. So you would just kind of brainstorm that out with the group. Now we can look at her next decision when she arrives at the farmer's market. Let's assume that she's brand new, she's a brand new shopper to this market and she doesn't already know the farmers and have relationships with them. Think about and brainstorm what would make her choose one booth over another. Uh, again, it might be clear signage, uh, a good display um, that you're looking up and you're smiling and you're not on your phone. So these different qualities, you know, you're welcoming. We discuss sometimes the fact that you might have samples out, that you have clear signage that shows your pricing. So it's not a guessing game about what the prices will be uh, and so on. And the point with this is to, just to understand that when we take the time to understand our consumer, then we can begin to communicate back to them uh, what's important. So each customer that you will have, each type of customer, let's say, uh, as farms develop their own target customer audience, it's important to understand these four traits of those customers. They have needs, motivations, desires, and buying habits. Needs are very basic, and, and of course we all have needs for food. So I use this carrot example uh, to talk through each of these. Um, the, the need for carrots is basic, right? I need groceries, I need food. So here we'll say, I need carrots. Uh, to understand what a need is. Then, but the motivation is the thing that would guide my decision making when I'm going out to get carrots. So we'll say here, this customer might say, I wanna support local farms and avoid pesticides when I buy carrots. So now there's a motivation that's driving this purchase. And again, it might lead me to the farmer's market or so on. The next thing is the desires. And we really have to think about that as anything extra that we can add to our product or that we can offer. It's sort of the icing on the cake. So in this example, I'm gonna say, I want red cord chantonnay carrots for my dinner party. Red cord chantonnay is a variety of carrot that has a very pretty, you know, exciting name. 
example. So we, what we're giving here that we're adding above um, the basic need and the supporting the local farms, the motivation, now we're adding maybe bragging rights or if they want to impress their friends or something interesting that's, that's above and beyond an ordinary carrot. So just the idea that we can give people a little something extra that we know that they want might be the edge. And finally, there are buying habits, which is a very important trait to study with your target customer. And that is to say where they need to pick up their food, what's actually going to work with them. So for the buying habits, we'll say, I don't have time to stop at the farmer's market for just one thing. So as a marketer, when we understand this customer, uh, if we're only selling at a farmer's market, we might begin to figure out where else we need to get our product, whether it's a roadside stand or a local uh, grocery store, see if we can get our product in there because we want to reach this customer where they're actually shopping. Been talking about, uh, and I will continue to talk about a lot of this um, discussion in terms of people who are in direct to consumer channels like farmers markets and, and other direct to consumer channels like free to trade and such. Um, but I just want to point out at this stage that whoever your target customer is, it still pays to think about them this way. So if you're doing wholesale primarily, let's say to restaurants, then you'd, you'd still be thinking about the needs of that buyer and the motivations, um, the extra that you can give them and how they really want to buy, how they want to order, how they want to deliver, um, you know, what their needs and, and motivations and desires are. You could also go so far back in the chain to think about how feeder buyers or other kinds of buyers at a feeder auction might be selecting their their animals that they're going to buy so you're still thinking about the needs and motivations and desires of your target customer even if you're selling feeders um, and how if you cater to those to those characteristics of the of the buyer at the auction you will receive better prices so the same thinking even though i'm going to you know go back to speaking primarily about direct-to-consumer. The same thinking applies whether you're selling breeding stock or feeders or wholesale and so on. The principles will remain the same. So as we develop a marketing strategy, we're gonna to start to think about what do customers actually want? And when customers ask us questions like, are you organic or are you grass-fed and so on, <clears throat> which are the most commonly asked questions and when you're direct to consumer, you have to uh, decode those questions and try to figure out what are they really asking? What do they want to know about my farm and about my, my animals? Um, because you wouldn't simply, let's just say that, that you weren't certified organic. Um, you wouldn't just say no and let someone walk away. You'd want to find out, well, what, you know, what are your concerns? What, do you, what would you like to know about my farm? And then you, you could begin to elaborate about how your animals are handled, uh, how, what they're fed, and where you get your feed from, or if you grow your own, and so on. And chances are, um, by taking the time to really understand what, what may seem like a, a simple uh, yes or no question on the surface, it's, it's really about understanding more deeply what the person is concerned about and what they're searching for. So there's some work to be done on decoding uh, what people really, what really ask. And you have to consider that with some consumers, um, they don't know, they may not have fully thought through what they're asking, to tell you the truth. They may have read an article or heard a term, um, but they don't have a great understanding of it. And so you want to take the time to begin to understand what people are searching for. So when we think about local foods, um, local meat particularly, uh, we think about who are these buyers and the more we can understand them, the better we can reach them. So I'm gonna introduce four distinct groups that I've developed through the years, but for any one farm, their marketing strategy should be even much more specific than these four broad groups. But to introduce the groups, um, we have four main groups. One would be the foodie or local lore uh, enthusiasts. So they're really food enthusiasts and the sort of primary motivation behind their purchasing is the experience. And the experience comes in um, many forms. It's, it's the experience of, of going to the farmer's market, talking to the producers, 
It's the experience of trying new cuts that they've never used, trying new recipes, and so on. The next group is the socially motivated um, or cause-driven consumers. So they have a cause that they believe in and they want to support that with each purchase. Um, the social causes could range from humane treatment of livestock uh, to the environment, to the local economy, like we discussed earlier, but it might also be their own personal health uh, and their belief um, and their perception that they're only going to buy the purest, most healthy foods possible. And so that's the cause that they're supporting. So you have cause-driven consumers and um, they are probably more price sensitive than a foodie because a foodie is pursuing not only you know, getting food for eating, but they're also pursuing a hobby. So they're probably the least price sensitive group. But now the socially motivated or the cause driven group will be slightly more price sensitive. Uh, however, there are studies that have shown that this type of consumer, even if they're moderate to low income, will still pay premiums because they really believe in the cause that they're supporting. The next group are called traditional buyers. And they're probably more um, price driven or you could call them value driven. And these are the folks that are gonna buy quarters and half of, halves of animals um, through the freezer trade. Um, they're looking for you know, quality and uh, a price advantage. They're not necessarily just going to be looking for the lowest possible price, but they're looking for a great value. And of course, every consumer group wants a value. That's the perception that uh, what they paid and what they received are sort of in sync. But the traditional buyer is probably more um, like your rural uh, communities and, and um, folks that are maybe a little less concerned about particular causes, but still looking for good prices and good food. The traditional buyer group has often been overlooked in the local foods movement, in my experience. And there is a great opportunity, like I said, with selling quarters and halves to reach this group and to do very well. And if you think about the traditional buyer, they really have a loyalty to you. Uh, once you sell them something and they're happy with the experience, they're going to come back year after year. Of course, lots of farms have had uh, customers through the freezer trade that have returned you know, for 10 years or more. Um, in contrast, you could discuss the loyalty of a foodie. If a foodie is really looking for an experience with every purchase, then they might be looking for new experiences all the time. And so they're not necessarily going to be loyal customers. If they get a great steak from you at the farmer's market, you know, and they, and they brag about how great it was on their Facebook page or whatever, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to buy their next steak from you because they're going to want to try something else, try it from another farm, right? So you have this comparison of foodies who um, will, will pay uh, higher prices and, and be less price sensitive, and then you have, but maybe they're not going to be very loyal customers. Uh, and then you have this contrast of traditional buyers who are more concerned about prices, but more likely to become loyal customers over time. And the final group that we'll talk about are the ethnic or religious groups, and which we'll call culturally driven. And these are people who are um, have you know restrictions or um, special requirements for the meat that they eat, and they're going to be seeking that meat to preserve cultural traditions or, like I said, religious restrictions. And um, of course, we can think about different. Uh, ethnic groups that are searching for lamb or goat or for certain holidays, religious holidays. But of course, I like to point out that every American that buys a turkey at Thanksgiving is an, is an ethnic buyer. They're supporting a cultural tradition of eating turkey on that holiday. Um, once again, the ethnic and religious buyers are probably a great group to think about long-term loyalty with. If they have a good experience with you, then they will come back and they will probably begin to play other members of their community. 
So strategy development, we've been kind of leading our discussion into this idea of developing a marketing strategy for the farm that focuses on one uh, target customer group and serves them very well. And I get some, um, you know, I've had some resistance through the years from friends that are farming who said, why do I need a marketing strategy? Everybody needs food, everybody needs to eat, and so uh, I don't really need marketing strategy to sell my product. And I understand that, but I, uh, I started to address those questions with these, the following points. One is to say that having a written strategy that guides your decisions will really begin to focus your identity as a farm and as a business in the market. So it begins to give some definition and specificity to your image. It'll also help focus the message that you say out to, uh, in your in your materials and in your conversations. Next, it, it addresses this effectiveness of labor that we discussed and that rate. And when you make your decisions are based on a strategy and a written set of written objectives, then um, it's going to pay off literally in effectiveness. Strategy will help with differentiation in the market and positioning. These are two concepts that have to do with how your different from competitors and other suppliers, and um, where how customers perceive and view your business. So it's more about focusing your message and your identity again. It'll also help attract your target customers. Uh, I always joke, it's like the, you know, the scent of a flower attracting a bee. You know, you're putting out a certain message into the marketplace, and once people understand what you're all about, they'll begin to be attracted in to that signal. It will also quite, you know, sincerely allow you to serve your customers better. The more you focus on a strategy based on a target audience and take the time to understand everything about how they shop and how they use the product and what they're looking for, then you can serve them better with each step. And finally, uh, perhaps the most compelling reason is to think about all the changes that come in the marketplace and how to be prepared for those changes. It's better to have a plan in place or a strategy in place um, when changes come to the market as opposed to trying to react when you see your sales beginning to slip due to a change in the marketplace. And though there are many kinds of changes we've seen, you know, a lot of things go through the local meat world in the last 15 years, and that's going to continue to change all the time. Another reason to use strategy is um, to just look at the demand in the marketplace and the need for effective marketing skills. So there was a time, if you follow this, this is a made up drawing that I did, but it gets across this point that the demand for local food, or we could say for local meat, has certainly been increasing for the last 20 years, but not at a dramatic rate. Meanwhile, a lot of farms have responded to that demand and entered the marketplace. In fact, you know, in my area, we have old traditional farms that have been around a long time that are now entering direct consumer channels for the first time. In addition, we have brand new farms that are just getting started in response to local foods demand. So there was a period that was probably in the past where there was much more demand for local meat than there was supply. And so at that time, marketing strategy may not have really been needed. You could more or less show up at a market and sell everything you've got, right? So that's show up and sell out time. But I think that time is, is over and we're in a, a time where there's a lot of um, mimicking products or good enough products that are in the market. You know, the large, the large companies have responded to some of this demand um, and come up with products that look just like local. Uh, in addition, all these other producers have scaled up and have entered the market. And so we're at a point where if you want to succeed in a market where the supply is larger than demand, you're going to need to apply marketing skills and those skills are developed out of strategy. So to develop a farm's strategy is really um, fun, and, and pretty easy to do. And the way that we like to do it is using this sentence. So you're, uh, any individual farm is just going to fill in the words that are in red here with their own words. The more specific those words can be, the better the sentence will work. 
it's a good time for me to remind people that when they work on this sentence and, and if they're successful, um, that it's not a sentence that you put out for the public to see. It doesn't go on your brochures and your Facebook page, but really it's a sentence in your plan that you use and that you refer to when you're making any marketing decision, really anything from what kind of bags should we buy for consumers that carry our product away in to what words do we put on that brochure. And I think I can show that with some of these examples that are fun to do. So I recommend doing these examples with the group, asking people to fill it in. And the one that we start off with is Kraft cheese, uh, Kraft macaroni and cheese. So uh, if we all worked at Kraft and we had to market this product, we would work on a strategy sentence. And in fact, I learned this sentence technique while taking marketing classes at Cornell. And um, they were sort of, my, my peers in that class were becoming, were getting trained to become brand managers at companies like Kraft and Coca-Cola and so on. And they really do employ this technique, but it's very applicable to uh, small farms and their marketing. So we look at this sentence and we try to write it for this product and we ask people, all right, um, our farm raises, and then you describe the product, uh, any claims that you might wanna add to the product, um, for target customer, and you say who that target customer is as specifically as possible, and then who, and you describe more detail about that product, uh, about that customer, whether it's an activity that they do or some um, demographics or behaviors that they have. So if we were to do this for the Kraft Mac and Cheese example, we'd say, um, okay, our company makes, of course we know it's not a farm, our company makes, what do we make? And often people will suggest that we make mac, macaroni and cheese. And um, then you wanna keep moving. So you say, well, you know, who, who do they make that for? And often they'll say, well, we make, they make it for kids. All right, so now you're gonna start to ask some questions and challenge people. Who, who's really, um, who are we really serving with this product? Yes, it's kids that eat it, but, but who are we? serving when we sell this product and someone will, will inevitably say that okay it's really the parents or the moms that are buying the product and in fact 80 percent of the groceries in the united states are purchased by women so i think it's fair to say that it's moms primarily that we're looking at um, all right so if it's a mom you know what are some of the qualities of, about this mom and so they'll say she's very busy she's a working mom she doesn't have a lot of time, uh, she's exhausted, you know, it's the end of the day, a busy work day. And so what are we really providing mom with? Is it macaroni and cheese? Uh, and people will catch on and they'll say, we're, we're really providing dinner. So you, you can write this up on a, a whiteboard or a notepad. You know, uh, our company makes dinners for busy working moms who have no time. All right, now what else can we say about the product in this sentence, the claims? Well, what we're providing her with is a fast, easy, cheap dinner, and, and people will often come up with this. So we produce fast, easy, cheap dinners for busy working moms who have run out of time. All right, so now, um, now that we've written this sentence, you can see how we wouldn't want to put it right on the package. It's really for us to study and think about uh, the questions that we have as marketers, first off would be, how can we improve this product for this customer? And if they value it because it's fast and easy, then we can think about how can we make the product faster and easier? And in fact, this old version that I have pictured is the version where you had to boil water and measure milk and measure butter. So certainly we could make that easier and faster, and they did end up coming out with microwave versions. Um, so, so even if people you know, don't prefer to eat that kind of food, they can recognize that the product was improved. Next, we can think about if we have a limited marketing budget and we want to maximize our gross sales per dollar spent on marketing, in this case, um, what magazine should we put an ad in? And people will think about it and they'll come up with something like parenting magazine, right? So to, make, to get the most bang for our advertising dollar, we're gonna put this ad 
where we think busy working moms will see it. We wouldn't want to put the ad in the New York Times, not to say that that busy working moms don't read the New York Times, but the New York Times maybe reaches everyone, you know, sort of air quotes everyone. And we don't want to reach everyone because that's not effective. We want to get right to our target customer and reach them. So that's why we're going to go with Parenting Magazine. Next, we could discuss what should the ad say. Uh, and people will have some ideas, but you know, it would kind of lead them to thinking that the ad might want to say, dinner is ready in three minutes or something to that effect, because we know she values it because it's fast and easy. So we're simply going to use the ad to say back, our product is fast and easy, right? So we can get to thinking about uh, the implications of using a strategy sentence, uh, writing it well, and then using it to make our decisions to improve our product and to serve the customer better. And it's really um, very easy to see. And, and if you want to do a second example, then you could use the pair of Carhartts because, of course, we could end up developing a sentence that says that Carhartt makes you know, durable, uh, tough clothing for people who work in the outdoors and who work in the trades, like carpenters and farmers and lumberjacks, right? Um, that's that's how the sentence would be written. But then we can begin to think about, um, well, we can begin to think about how when you have a target customer, you don't alienate all the other customers that are out there. So uh, that. That's sometimes a concern that folks have is that, well, if I target and focus on one specific group, then that means I'm going to lose all the rest of the customers that don't identify the same way. But in fact, uh, that's not true, and we can see lots of examples. So with Kraft Mac and Cheese, if they're targeting busy working moms with young children, um, but they're delivering fast, easy, cheap dinners, then other consumers will still be drawn in to buy that product. And you know, we can ask the folks that are attending, who, who else buys a lot of Kraft Mac and Cheese? And they'll have already guessed college students. Well, sure. So you know, a young guy in college who's 18 or 19 years old may not identify with busy working moms, but he understands what the product delivers. It delivers fast, easy, cheap dinners. And that's something he wants. So this is back to my reference earlier about sort of the, the scent of a flower attracting the bee in. You will attract your target customer through effect, effective strategy, but you won't alienate the rest of the consumers either. They'll all be attracted because they understand just what the product does. And the same applies to Carhartt. And we can think about folks who are not working in the trades or working outdoors who still feel that they need to get some Carhartts you know, because they have to roll a till a flower bed in their front yard, well, I better go get some car hearts so uh, I can get this work done. It's kind of something you can get people laughing with. So a, a sentence that's written very specifically and effectively can impact uh, a lot of decision making on the farm, the marketing decisions that we discuss, but even back to production decisions. Think about, uh, I understand the consumer's need uh, when they buy you know, this meat for me, and maybe I'm even going to change frame size or the feed or some other component of the product, uh, what size packages I sell, if I do spicy sausage or, or light sausage and so on. So ultimately, this sentence can be used to inform a lot of decisions all the way back into production. And we can do a little brainstorm activity and, and knowing what we know now about strategy, ask how would busy working moms on a budget like to buy sausage and what kind of sausage would they buy and people can start to think about well a busy working mom might like to buy fresh not frozen because they don't have time to thaw it out or that maybe that planning that goes into thawing out sausage and if they're feeding kids they probably don't want really hot spicy or fancy sausages um, they might want two pound packages instead of one pound packages if they're feeding a bunch of kids. You know, a family of four or more or one pound isn't gonna cut it. They might like patties already formed or links already formed instead of bulk. And then maybe there's even some way to think about a home delivery scheme where you're dropping off 
10 pounds of sausage every month automatically because then they don't have to put thoughts into where and when they're going to buy the product. So a lot of thinking can be done just based on this um, part of a strategy sentence up here about serving busy working moms on a budget. And to further illustrate the effectiveness and the usage of strategy, I'll just give this example. I, I love to use a carrot. It takes a step away from talking about meat and shows how this stuff is universal to food marketing. So here are some examples of different target customers, large chain grocery store, small natural food store, and so on. And then um, how we might market carrots to them. And then even informing production, what variety of carrot might make the most sense to grow for that customer. So you can just sort of talk through some examples. Uh, for the large chain grocery store, we're going to sell our carrots topped, you know, uh, in two pound bags. We might grow the Bolero carrot because it's a great storage carrot. It, it lasts really well in storage and, and can put a large volume away for a long time and sell, sell out of that supply. But then for the, lack, the local natural food store, we might want to do a more exciting or interesting variety like a rainbow mix with different colored carrots. And we would keep the greens on those carrots and sell them in one pound bunches because that's going to have greater appeal in that setting to that customer. And also we would sell them in one pound bunches instead of two pound bags because we plan to charge a higher price per pound or per, per bunch. Uh, and then also you can talk through some of the other examples and how that works. So um, <clears throat> just to reinforce some of the thinking about strategy, um, the opposite of marketing strategy is what I would call autopilot. And the, the default strategy sentence, if, if you don't develop one for your farm, then the default is we sell whatever we have to anyone who will buy it. And of course, uh, people can recognize that that's not a very efficient way to sell um, because you don't have a specific group you're trying to reach. You're just sort of broadcasting it out there and hoping for the best. Um, when you do have strategy, you can concentrate on your exact and specific goals the needs of your of your target audience and develop the best way to reach them. I have a great example um, that I'd like to talk about, which is uh, the piggery is a, a, a farm with a, eventually with a butcher shop up here in my area. And when they were just getting started out, they couldn't even get into the local farmers market because it was full. But they were producing producing all of uh, this charcuterie, all these fancy products with their pork. They could have run an ad in the local paper that said uh, local pate now available, right? And they would have reached people who read the local paper and that would have had a certain payoff measurable in gross sales. Um, but instead what they did was very clever. They approached a local wine shop that has a tasting night and they asked if they could pass hors d'oeuvres during the tastings. So um, on, the, on Thursday nights, people can taste six different wines and what the piggery proposed is that they'll pass free hors d'oeuvres in between each one. What they did there was reach a very specific audience and you can ask people to brainstorm who might attend wine tasting nights and the effectiveness of that investment of the free samples and the time versus running an ad in the local paper. What kind of customers do you reach at wine tasting nights? All right, a little reality check for strategy development. Your marketing strategy directs your decisions consciously based on your target market's preferences. So these needs, motivations, desires, and buying habits. You're going to take the time to, to sit around the, the kitchen table on the farm with a pot of coffee and develop who your target audience is and then really begin to understand why they buy the way that they buy and what they're searching for. Um, so your whole strategy is helping you make decisions and you're going to get out of the autopilot um, decision making and start making conscious decisions based on these, these traits of these customers. And to remind you that your strategy sentence is not for your brochure. This is uh, internal decision making sentence that's in your plan that you sort of reference when you make 
any decision what to say in an ad, where to put the ad. As I mentioned before, uh, how big a package does the consumer want? Um, how are we, what's our label going to say? Uh, what kind of bags do we buy and so on? Can all be, can all be uh, informed by looking at that strategy sentence when the sentence is well written. <clears throat> Even though we're talking about having a very specific focus on one group of people and, and serving them very well and understanding them in great detail, um, the outward appearance of your marketing won't seem unusual or, or un, out of place for normal consumers, and, and you really won't alienate customers that are not your target customers. So uh, this is to say that you don't have to be worried about focusing on one group and doing a really great job focusing on them. It's not going to drive other folks away, and it's not going to make the image of your marketing seem unusual. Again, as I pointed out, when I was taking classes, uh, on marketing, they were teaching these techniques to people who were going to go out and work for the big companies. And you don't see their marketing as strange or targeted, even though that's what's operating in the background. So just uh, sort of uh, tie it off for this section. Uh, we just went through the marketing strategy um, portion of a marketing plan. We'll address the other portions in different presentations that are uh, coming up. Um, it's really uh, very practical and usable advice and um, I encourage every farm to have their first marketing meeting, which is to say that they get their, their marketing team, which is probably their spouse and their family, to sit down on um, the kitchen table perhaps on a rainy day, brew up a pot of coffee and start talking about your target customer and start developing your strategy sentence. Think about the implications of that sentence on your decisions. So talk with your team and write your strategy sentence. Really make that sentence very specific, uh, focusing on, on really uh, the heart of the decision making and the characteristics of that customer. If you, write, if you end up with a sentence that sounds very flowery and would look good on a brochure, then that sentence isn't working. You have to work on one that you wouldn't really want to share with folks. There's a resource that uh, farms are welcome to read. It's about two pages long. It can be found online by simply searching Cornell Smart Marketing and finding the article that was released in October of 2017 that addresses uh, exactly what we've discussed in this slideshow. Thanks.